<laughs> Mets Padres never came the up. Game, Tony, yes. It is. It's Stugant is Stugant in his marriage. The is, old three for one. Is is one of those street performers moving around in the streets of New York, moving the shells around, and you think you got it. You watch them play it moments ago. Uh, clearly, um, you know where it is, and you always lose. There is no winning of the shell game, even though because it's not under any of the shells, right? They're, they're, they've removed it. I, I'm pretty sure that you don't even have a thirty. 3% chance of guessing correctly at the shell game. And how do you guys imagine Abby's got to have gotten very good at this, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think, I don't think you get things past her. She can. I mean, I came to her with, Hey, I, I've learned in less than a year. Right. What's going on with you at all times. <laughs> yes. You and I have played the shell game many a times. Yes, we have. And you've never won. <laughs> no, no, I don't think you've ever won either, Whittingham. I believe. You think you've won. I'm, That's the beauty I, of the I, shell game. I believe yeah. you've lost all of them. I, but I, I scheduled a mean to come in for a full week when I thought you'd be off for a day because I was preparing for the shell game. Shame. Uh. Yeah, I uh, I have some good break- job by you. I have some breaking news here. As Mike Ryan goes and wants an immediate line tonight on a Colts Broncos game that makes me sad. A month in that the, tonight's game, Thursday night game, it's a big got, one. We've Dan. Got, we've aggressively got, not watching. We've yeah. gotten to sad already with me. Uh, so many injuries all over the place. This already. game looks so good <laughs> at the start of the season. Yeah. The, the Matt Ryan stats I gave the other day are crazy, where he's been sacked as much in four games as Philip Rivers was in 16. Matty Ice. And, and I mean, for, listen, for the Colts that, are one and two, Dan. They're right in the mix. I mean, one, two, and one. <laughs> oh, one, two, and one. The coveted tie. <laughs> Just a half game behind the Titans and the Jaguars. I, mean, I can't tell which quarterback has fallen off more in this matchup. Did you see what Rashad Penny said? He just had a huge game against the the Lions, and he said that uh, he feels more free to run when the quarterback doesn't when he doesn't have to worry about the quarterback messing with the plays. You know, the Seahawks hated Russell Wilson, <laughs> hated him, and now when I watch Denver, I'm kind of hoping for Russell Wilson to change the plays because I hate that offense. Low key, Geno Smith has been like top seven in all quarterback categories. Like he's playing really, really well. It's crazy. Well, How? Uh, you guys tell me this, okay? Uh, Warren uh, Warren Sharp. Uh, as we do all of this evaluation at from all angles of this sport, trying to understand it better, uh, doing deep dives, uh, Tony is watching film and reviewing tape. <laughs> Warren Sharp is pointing out that last year, the Arizona Cardinals on third down had an amazing conversion rate, a conversion rate that was well above what the expectation of the conversion rate should have been. And so the Cardinals started the season 10 and one and we're like, holy shit, they're the best team in football. And then they fell apart. And since then it's felt like you don't trust them to be disciplined or anything. You're, you're waving around the contract clause on Kyler Murray and being like, that's just playground ball. But now the numbers, now the numbers, as there's been regression to the mean, they were first in the league in converting above the expectation last year. Now they're last last in the league converting above the expectation. So what is the evaluation of Kyler Murray? A couple of seasons in, they've just given him the money. The, he got smeared with the contract clause that he's playing too many video games. You see Baker Mayfield being batted at the line all the time, 10 times. I don't think anyone disputes that Kyler Murray is going to is great, is great fun, and is going to be great, correct? Uh, I still think he's... He's having a decent season. It's five touchdowns, two interceptions, uh, 991 yards passing. But how do you feel about Arizona? I feel like Arizona is one of those teams. If they get hot, if, if some you trust guys... Them? You trust Arizona? I don't trust them right now, uh, but I could see myself trusting them moving forward in large part because I think Kyler Murray will play even better than he's played right oh, now. Man, you're, you're counting on... On Kyler Murray and the Cardinals to turn it on in the second half, that has not been their deal. I mean, stranger been, things have happened in the NFL. They've been the exact opposite. I actually think that there's two players that are always compared to each other because of their climb into the pros, their height, Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield, and I think it's similar. But what Kyler has that Baker doesn't is his athleticism to lean on when the league is kind of caught on to his game. Baker had an amazing rookie season. The league adjusted to him. He he had nothing else up his sleeve. Kyler can still do the backyard football thing. What happens when that goes? I don't know. Because 
he's reputed to not be able to study the game uh, with a way that some of the other quarterbacks do. And now he's beefing with his quarterback, uh, with it, with his head coach on the sidelines. I'm very curious to see how this thing rides out. I think the issue is you have a guy who is schematically not good in Cliff Kingsbury, and you match him with a quarterback that is not doing stuff at the line that makes sense for other quarterbacks to do. And you have this where there's there's wide receivers running routes that they're running into each other like the scheme is just bad the reason but that's wild to me though isn't it because cliff kingsbury came in to coach around kyler murray they were very successful over got two rid seasons. of josh rosen made a made one of the clinical moves that mcveigh made that not a lot of these guys make which is do the surgical hard decision tear the band-aid off right now don't try to do it with josh rosen flip it over you can do value at quarterback Arizona now did it after a year other i'd like to you know, Sean McVay coached Jared Goff for a couple seasons before letting him go. We went to a Super Bowl, and it was, you know, the end of the first... That was the first year, done, I'm moving on to Kyler Murray. The, for me, the thing that's amazing is how quickly that narrative flipped. It went from... Well, the they expectations were, they, changed. That's what happened. 9-0, and 10-0. Right. Then they had a bad second half. Then they got embarrassed in the playoff game. Then they got off to an 0-2 start, and it's Cliff Kingsbury's bad. And it's like, how did how did that happen? So does it happen that quickly in the NFL? Well, the reason I asked the question, the reason I went from Russell Wilson to Arizona is because, and I know the audience is tired of this, but I just think as a reference point, it's kind of fascinating. As they figure out that you need to have value at that position, you got to win in the margins with salary cap sport because there are no other places to, to win. you got to win by being better at evaluating players and finding value. And in that league, six-time executive of the year, Bill Polian, thought Lamar Jackson was not a quarterback. Wouldn't play quarterback in the league. That's how the talent evaluation was being done. Didn't matter. Smaller guys. Now Russell Wilson showed them. And Russell seems to have something that Tua doesn't have, right? Because I don't think of Tua, or I don't think of Russell Wilson as, as flimsy, but like mixed martial artists, I do think of him as someone who's learned how to fall. Someone who avoids contact so that he never got hit like RG3. But they've gotten smaller. All of those guys have gotten smaller. That used to not be a thing. I watched Baker Mayfield get 10 balls batted this weekend where I'm watching it. I'm like, is J.J. Watt batting all of this? No, it's two or three guys who look like J.J. Watt who are wearing 90s and just holding up their hands and Baker can't get the ball over them. <laughs> the reason I'm asking you all of this about Arizona and the game tonight that Mike is, uh, what do you got, three and a half, desperately looking at the uh, line? You three and a half. I'm not going to tip my hand because I'm in a very competitive league with some people here in the studio, and I believe <laughs> last week I tipped my hand and people tailed. I've been poking around all week with you, like trying to get a, trying to get a feel for who you're taking tonight. What? I'm going to say it right now. I'm taking Denver, just so you know, okay? You fool. But, go go okay, uh, the, the reason that I'm asking the question, as, as the Colts try and go another old quarterback with Matt Ryan, because we kind of forget they've had to do that because Andrew Luck did something nobody was expecting. So since then, it's just been like, oh, bleep. We just got to go get guys. Just somebody back there, because we were not expecting Andrew Luck to be the only one of these guys who quits early and leaves 10 years on the I'll contract. I'll never forget where Billy was when Andrew Luck did that. <laughs> Russell Wilson is what now, Mike? Do you trust your evaluations? They gave him seven years, and I don't... I'm looking at that offense, and I'm like, how is that going to get better? I thought these guys had good skill talent. I think Judy's good, although Shannon Sharp keeps telling me he's not. But is it going to be 16 <laughs> points a game? Is that what it's going to look I, like? I, I I don't have faith in this head coach. He doesn't exactly inspire confidence, but I am a little shook. I, Russell Wilson was always one of my favorite players. And I was always team let Russ cook. And it seems as though from quotes from Seattle players and seeing how Geno Smith is playing right now that Russ cooking wasn't necessarily a good thing. I don't really know how to evaluate. Russell Wilson does not look good to me. Have we ever seen what you're saying? The former players putting their name again and again on. I did not like Russell Wilson. Not, not with, a, with a champion, no. I mean, we've seen it. We're seeing it with some of the people that you cited, with Baker Mayfield. Like his former teammates talk shit about him all the time. But it's also Baker Mayfield. He doesn't have a social capital really to lean on. Uh, Russell Wilson's a Super Bowl champion. Russell, we've seen Russell Wilson will his team to victory by making unbelievable plays on his own, like he were in the playground. I I am very I'm very stunned to see what's happened with the uh, with the reaction from Seattle. I, I there's a reason why Denver has so many primetime games this year. Everybody thought that that was a good fit. That's a great situation. They were a quarterback away. Judy Sutton, the two running backs that they have. This is a a, a team that's primed and ready with a good defense, and they look. 
bad to me. When we bad. talk about names at the position, brand management at the position, what you're going to do with your career, quarterbacks lead the way in the futures, do guys. Hell, Mark Sanchez is broadcasting games. Like, you can have a voice around this game forever if you're a quarterback. Russell Wilson has handled his brand in a very careful way, and at the end, be careful what you wish for because he got out of Seattle where it appears Is he every at the end? I mean, he's 33. I mean, mean, yeah, but that's not the end anymore. But but just look at at what you were watching. It's the beginning for some. But it was the end for guys like Cam Newton. Right. But it's not. But it's Geno Smith's beginning. It's it's not the end, though, because he just signed a seven-year deal. But I'm asking you, as I imagine Denver is asking itself, maybe they think it's all Hackett's fault. He can't coach. He's already brought a time manager in because he screwed things up. But at the end of games, I always used to fear, here comes Russell Wilson. Like, if there were always close games in Seattle, and it was always at the end, oh my God, that's dangerous. You don't want him running around. You don't want him throwing the ball. Denver's constipated. I don't want to watch them. I don't want to watch Denver play football, even if they're going to win 1916. I saw that with Teddy Bridgewater already. That's sure. not what I want to be watching. I in enjoyed Denver. them way more last year. Uh, no I, doubt. But guys, I enjoyed watching Denver's run game way more last year than whatever this slop is. They need to fix it. But we're going to erase 10 years of a ma- Hall of Fame level quarterbacking by Russell Wilson, and we're just going to bail on all that in four games? I'm not erasing four it. Four games? I'm not erasing it. I'm just saying that you the don't data, think he can get it back? The data points have changed for me a little bit, in which I grade his career as a whole. It, it's totally changed my prism. And is he going to be one of those guys that ages like, like Breeze did to a degree, like Rodgers is right now, like Tom Brady is? Now we're we're being convinced that that's the norm. When really historically, Russell Wilson's at the age where you start seeing a dip. This, this is a very new phenomenon. My, Stugatz is taking an easy position of that slanderous to write off a champion, a Hall of Famer after four games, even though he's made a career of it. Stugatz. I has. mean, Dan, he's been great. I mean, the last four years, he has been great. Stugatz. All I'm saying is that the first month of the season that I've saw from that I saw from Denver. All I'm framing for you is the story here. Okay, mm-hmm. I I don't know and don't care if Russell Wilson goes for 38 tonight, but I'm taking you inside his head. He's left Seattle for Denver. Denver. He's come over here. His coach doesn't seem to know what he is doing. He signed for a lot of money. His image, uh, people kind of know that he's lame. And his and former teammates are now free to bash him again and again and again. He's got a game tonight that matters on a team I don't know he totally trusts, because why would he? he? just got there. But he thought this was greener pastures, and that's the pressure on a quarterback's head. That's what happens when these guys are, you know, when you ask, what's their mental toughness? Right there, Stugatz. It's not easy being Russell Wilson tonight. He might love playing football, but wouldn't you understand if his confidence was slightly shaken? Uh, Yeah, I would understand it, but I don't think his confidence in himself is shaken. I think the confidence in what's around him is a but, bit shaken. But when you're out there playing that game, Stugatz, those things you can't need those be, people you around can't you, be right. separated. You yes. can't separate those things. Like, right. And Mike is telling you that all these guys seems to have seem to have a problem with the way that he was doing it in Seattle. That the, that he could be at the end of games. He could erase all of that. Winning, winning erases all of it. But Denver's not terribly interesting. What he did in Seattle over the last four years, besides winning a Super Bowl, is 101 touchdown passes and 31 interceptions. Like I'm not really interested and in unha- what his teammates but, but feel. Seemed, you know? Wanted to get out of there, though. I know he wanted to get out of there, and he got out of there. He's in Denver, but I'm not writing Russell Wilson off because he, of he a slow boo- start. He was booed by Seattle's to God's. Like they was, he was booed by the fan base as a beloved. Well, Dan, it's a fan base that knows Russell Wilson wants to leave that fan base. Of course, yeah. they're going to boo him. What are I, they supposed to do? Yeah, that. that... That changed the perception a little bit. And to go back to the original topic with with Kyler Murray is what's happening to him right now in accelerated career arc that we're seeing right now in Denver with Russell Wilson. It's like Kyler can cook and get you out of bad situations, but is for how long can he do this? Is Cliff Kingsbury all of a sudden bad at quarterbacking when Patrick Mahomes stands by Cliff Kingsbury, says he helped them, or is Patrick Mahomes that gifted? Which actually leads me to my set of the day. Oh, you have a set of the day? I have a set of the day that will knock your socks off. I don't believe Mm. it. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. I've got one too. Wow. What? I've got one too. Right. How many in 
invasions of Mike Schur's turf can we have in one show? Oh, this or this predated Mike Schur. Yeah, there you are. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. On Monday night, Patrick Mahomes can pass Troy Aikman on the all-time passing touchdowns list. <laughs> What's that That's number, hard. Mike? How, how, how many would he need? If, if, mean, he gets, if he gets four. Well, top five overrated quarterbacks to win a Super Bowl. If, if, he, if he gets four, he passes Troy Aikman and ties Brad Johnson. What? <laughs> For Johnson's set. ahead of Aikman? Yeah. <laughs> Troy Aikman had 165 passing touchdowns. We've been doing quarterback evaluations <laughs> badly since Brad Johnson and Troy Aikman. <laughs> it, it, Patrick Mahomes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I've been fighting it all day. Mm-hmm. Uh, medication, guys. Yeah. I'm very anxious. Mm-hmm. Patrick Mahomes has 162 passing touchdowns in his career. So with a, how many times have we seen Patrick Mahomes pass for three touchdowns? Like in a first half, he could tie him with Troy Aikman on the call, coincidentally, which would be awkward for Joe Buck and Troy Aikman because if he passes Troy Aikman, you all of a sudden have to hold the light to wait a second. How the hell did that happen, Troy? How <laughs> overrated of, are you? One of my favorite songs, "Devil Went Down to Georgia." Stugatz, the uh, the the devil has to put down his bow because he's been defeated. I, my stat of the day has been defeated, but I still do like that Tyreek Hill has more receiving yards than the Bears. That's a great stat. It, it's pretty good, uh, but I, I feel <laughs> you like might I, win. No, I, 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 mean, I feel like yours better, honestly. I, what? Patrick Mahomes has played football for really. Four years, five years? Five years. Yeah, yeah but he, he missed his rookie season. Right. Because he was behind Alex Smith. Yeah, still should be. Troy Aikman played 11. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see where Alex Let's Smith is on this list. Down. Let's go Hang ahead. on. Hang on. I want to see where Alex Smith <laughs> is on the you all-time don't want to passing play touchdown. Because Stu it's one of the all-time worst takes. It's such a great, terrible take that you uh, are. <laughs> hey, Alex Smith. At 199 career touchdowns, he is tied with Derek Carr wow. for 48. Derek Carr has 199 passing touchdowns. No, he's got more than Namath, right? Yeah. Like oh, Namath. By- no, I, I think with a really good game. Well, no, he's not. Gonna, he's gonna. Patrick Mahomes is gonna pass Namath in two weeks. <laughs> Can I stand up for shitty old quarterbacks? Sure. It was a completely different sport. They threw 20 times a game. There was no precision. Receivers could get the shit beaten out of them. The quarterbacks could get the shit beaten out of them. It's harsh. Marino's doing, still up there. 84, it, Marino. Still I know, up but there. That's, why, that's why he's a supernova in the history of football. Yes. Like, I, I still think he's one of the best quarterbacks of all time because he's that much better relative to his era. But... I mean, I don't know. Life just seems easier for quarterbacks now. Steve McNair had a 10-year run. His nickname was Air, for God's sakes. Patrick Mahomes is going to pass him in three weeks. <laughs> I'm looking up as we speak here three the uh, the statistical line uh, the statistical line for Bob Greasy in a Super Bowl. Uh, yes, 8 for 11 for 88 yards. I think that might have been his... I think that might have been the good one. I, mean, I think that would have been the explosion. With uh, four passing touchdowns tonight, Russell Wilson can actually tie John Elway all time in passing touchdowns. Jesus! All right, I need to get to a bit of news that I have not gotten to. But considering I- his trajectory, he might get to that next season. I have been remiss, Stugatz. We have not updated this story. I'm assuming that everyone here would want an update on this story because it was a rare viral baseball moment bigger than Aaron Judge's when uh, Tommy Pham slapped Jock Peterson in the head and I don't and was suspended for three games. And I have not gotten Tommy Pham's side of this. Have you guys gotten Tommy Pham's side of this? Because I'm just reading for the first time in an interview with the Boston Globe, he is quoted as saying, if anything, Jock's lucky I didn't hurt his ass even worse. So this is months later. It's still a fantasy football or fantasy baseball beef. I don't even know which fantasy it is. It must be football, right? I think it was football. Yeah. Tommy Pham just not letting it go. Regarding the Jock situation, I don't feel sorry for what I did. There's a certain level of respect that was crossed. Jock was disrespectful, and I don't condone the way he was talking to me in the group chat through the text. I don't condone that. And I just love athletes being as childish as the rest of us. And that group tasks, <laughs> someone goes over the line in group texts, and next thing you know, Jock Peterson is getting slapped. Because, and we all side with Tommy Pham. Like, don't, 
don't do that. Don't do that. Don't be a <laughs> jackass when my emotions are inflamed. And he was also making fun. Jock Peterson and others were making fun of the Padres in that. And uh, and Tommy Pham is still holding on to a grudge all a this time later. A lot of Twitter later. tough guys out there, Dano. And when you see him in person, you got to recognize, hey, I'll slap the back of your head. I don't give a shit. Yeah, well, that's that's Tommy Pham. I don't know how many well, baseball. Do. Yeah. I don't know how much baseball has like that. I don't know that baseball has many guys. Now everyone in the sport knows there's a line not to be crossed with Tommy Pham. In a group text. Yes. <laughs> and because he's still holding on to it. If he sees Jock Peterson again, he's going to do it again. He's telling the Boston Globe the three-game suspension was worth it. I still feel disrespected in the group text. <laughs> He didn't get his money's worth yet. <laughs> I know next to nothing else about Tommy Pham. He's been I wouldn't in, know if Tommy it, Pham was sitting in our studio right now. He's been in the big leagues for many years with, I think, many teams. And I would look like, I would because I just looked him up on the internet, his image. What's he just, look like? To just find, he's someone who's Tommy not Pham to be trifled black. with. What? We got a good one October 15th, Barclay Center in Brooklyn. Uh, the big men with the good nicknames. The Bronze Bomber against the Nordic Nightmare. Always enjoy talking to Deontay Wilder. Thank you again for making time for us. Deontay, where are you joining us from today? Um, I'm, um, I'm back home, my, home, my hometown of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The reason I wanted to talk to you about that is because you and I have talked some about uh, your upbringing and some of the things that you did to and why you go back home. So can you just tell people about the time before boxing, what your life was like, the details that you remember that shaped the path for you to get into boxing? Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the time before boxing, uh, uh, I uh, I was working at an IHOP at one point in time. And then uh, um, while being in college, um, I was at a community college, Shelton State, and then um, I had discovered that I had a child on the way, and I had to drop out of college, and um, I ended up getting another job as well. But while being in 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 college, I I had a friend that we always used to discuss what we were trying to do in life and what are the things we was trying to do to get there because talk is cheap, you know, unless you apply actions to it. That's the only way you 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 see some prog progress start to 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 um, um form and um he thought I, I i told him i'm gonna start boxing because of my daughter my daughter was born with spina bifida and uh that was the most scariest times of my life being 19 years old not really knowing what 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 i was gonna do my how my life has dramatically changed for me and then that's when i got into boxing i, I thought it would be uh something that i could could do and make some money and don't have to go to school to 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 have the requirements of us um to go to school and, and then go to a, a professional team and um so i i joined the gym in tuscaloosa and um uh, the rest from there is long story short it was history then I, I i was real focused on what i wanted to do um i wasn't doing it for self i was doing it for my daughter that has spina bifida and and, you know, God put me at the right place at the right time in my life during that time because the Olympics uh, was coming up around by 2008, the 08 Olympics. So we had to qualify in 07. So uh, during that time, that's when I just started. And uh, I made the Olympics team and medaled older than a year and a half. And then became a professional, became a champion, then became a long-time reigning champion of 10 consecutive title defenses. And so here I am now. You know, still on my my, my glory train when with you, a statue now. So in my hometown. When you mentioned the IHOP, was that part of the four jobs you had as an amateur boxer? Because you were working four jobs at once, were you not? Well, I was working three. I was working three at one point in time, all at once. But uh, this was all before boxing. What was the worst of those jobs? I'll talk to you about boxing in a second, but I'm always fascinated by the career path because I think it's crazy, Deontay. I think it's a, to make that choice, is, you, you make it sound easy just because you're a big puncher and everything. You make it sound easy, but that choice is a brutal one to have to make for your daughter. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to earn my living with my fists, and that's, what, and that's what I've got. I got my feet, I got my fists, I got my chin, and I'm going to earn a living that way. It's uh, Most people who make that decision have arrived at a real crossroads in life because it's a difficult decision to make with your, with your health, with your life, with your with your child's life. Yeah, that's totally that's definitely correct. You know, um, um, I we had an opportunity to, to terminate the pregnancy when um, the doctor gave us certain options, and we knew what we was facing. Me and her mother, 
And, um, you know, for me, I'm an energy person. I, I, I go off of energy felt whether I meet people, whether I go in a certain establishment, you know, uh, different things off the energy felt. And I just felt like that. She was, my daughter was meant to be, uh, she was meant to uh, live a life. You know, I was willing to accept all challenges, you know, that came behind her and her, uh, her, uh, her needs, her special needs that she, that was going to be required for her to uh, maintain a healthy life. And, uh, you know, fighting was the only thing that, that, that um, I knew that was going to, I can be able to be a professional. I always want to be a, a, in some type of professional sport. And, and um, you know, that was my only option. I felt that would get me there and can make an honest living and get to the top. I told my daughter when she was two years old, I looked in her eyes and said, Daddy was gonna, Daddy's going to be a world champion, and I'm going to be able to support you beyond your belief. And uh, I fulfilled that promise for her. And, uh, man, it's an amazing feeling just to go through the through, through the journey. But, you know, sometimes you had to go through to get to, you know, and um, that's how you'll be able to to really appreciate life and the good. You got to go through the bad to appreciate the good. You can't understand or appreciate good without going through the bad. And that just for for great test calls for great testimony. And these are my testimonies of how I became who I am. And um, I strive to be great every day. I tell people all the time, we all have greatness in us. For greatness is only determined by service. And every day I apply my service because every day that we wake up, we're blessed. Because we 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 face the inevitable every day. The inevitable chases us every day, and sometimes it get us. And it's get have, it, many have have it have gotten many. But we we wake up and and we're here and we're alive. So you know I, I'm grateful for all of my challenges and things I went through. It made me who I am today, the man I am right now. When did you know that your punch was special? Uh, I always could handle myself. Um, you know, streetwise, I always, you know, but t when I got into boxing, let's say more organized uh, fighting, when I got into boxing, I first started out as I wanted, I wanted to come into the gym. I didn't know nothing about amateur boxing and none of that. You know, I knew very little about the Olympics with Muhammad Ali and stuff like that, but I, I didn't know nothing about amateur boxing and getting to the Olympics and all that. So once I joined the gym, I, I, w I came in to be a journeyman. And a journeyman is a, is a is a professional fighter with with zero to maybe a few 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 fights, and he's just on his journey to the top. Because I needed money right now to support my daughter that that had a special need. You know, I I couldn't wait around. I wasn't going to wait around. And um, just joining the gym, I used to sport all pros. That's what I wanted to get prepared for. So I I would I would sport all the pros in there. It's starting out, and I end up sparring this one pro. He was, he was, he was, he was. He had a nice built about himself, real heavy, had a bald head with a gold teeth. You know, he'll chuck it at times when he look at you, to intimidate you. <laughs> and I remember in the first round, I was getting in with this fighter, and I wanted to test myself. I was gonna see what he, 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 he. We're gonna see what happens because you know most of the time you can get through the workout, but can't do the get through the sparring. And then sometimes you can get through the sparring but can't handle the workout. We can get through the workout, no problem. Let's see what I can do as a heavyweight, as a, a, a with sparring another professional heavyweight as being an amateur. So in the first round, I laid this man down. And within a couple of seconds of the first round, and as he held his head up while still laying on his back, he looked at me, he looked at my trainer, he looked back at me. <laughs> With a smile and look back at my train, he said, this guy right here is strong. Keep him in here. And from that point on, it kind of gave me um, some type of motivation or, or, or some type of high self-esteem or like, man, I can really do this. I, I got power, you know, which I've always known I've had power because, uh, you know, the saying is don't read a, a book by its cover. I've always been that, that product of don't read a book by its cover. And I always can be able to do things that others could do, but have a smaller frame. You know, even doctors now tell me, they say they don't see how I hit so hard with the frame that I have, that the frame that I have as far as my body is concerned, it doesn't match my power. 
So no matter what I do, if whatever I hit, either I'm going to destroy the thing I hit, destroy my hands, or it's going to be both. And most of the time, it's both. So, you know, so when that happened, we knew we had something going on. And from that point on, I, I started laying everything out. You know, a knockout out here, a knockout there. I mean, I'm 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 second behind my Tyson, the quickest knockout in the national tournament. And um, so we developed the power. We it's God given though. What I have is God given. One punch knockout power. I can really hit a man one one punch and knock him out. And uh, it's amazing fitter to have the equalizer when it's in the ring because I don't get paid for overtime. You know, we gonna get the money. You gonna get. You're going to get the same money in the first and the, uh, through the 12th <laughs> round. So I don't get paid for overtime. You, so you, God you, bless me. You, uh, <laughs> and this you, power that he blessed me with. <laughs> you uh, So you expected to just be a journeyman? You expected, I'm going to make some a quick couple of bucks here and there, but I'm not going to dream of championships. I just need to make money now. Take us back to where you were, Deontay, right then. Take us to the amount that you're fighting for and take us to the struggle of, of whether or not you're doubting whether you can make this a career. At that point, you're just going check to check, right? Well, um, I haven't made any money at that point in time. When I won, when I when I had the discussion of becoming a journeyman, um, I still I still was uh, I haven't even entered in the, into the rankings of of anything yet. It's just me discussing um, my plans of what I want to do, why uh, and why I'm joining this gym. Because my trainer, he he said his first impression of me was like the basketball court is down the street. You know what are you doing here, kid? You know I was coming in and probably a, a buck. 95 or whatever and, 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 and maybe between one 195 to two, 205 something like that and and telling him yay I you know I, I'm I, I'm coming I want to learn how to fight I want to be a champion you know support my daughter and you know all that was ideas and 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 planning out you know what we wanted to do and I told him I wanted to be a journeyman but like I said during that time the Olympics was coming around. Um, the 08 Olympics, and I joined the gym in 2006. So they had the 07, where was all the tournaments was happening to make it to the uh, the Olympic uh, trials and all that and, and different things to get on the Olympics team. So it didn't make no sense for me to become a journeyman at that time when I could become an amateur, make the Olympics team, and then when I get out of the Olympics, I get a big signing bonus, a, a plus along with a, a major promotion company. And now my money has doubled or even tripled, depending on how my career may go in life. So I chose to take the path of becoming a, uh, a amateur boxer instead of a journeyman because it was just it was it was foolish of me not to, although I needed the money at the moment in time. But. Good things come to those who wait, and I understand patience because patience is of a virtue. We we're human, so we're always gonna want things, and when we want them, nobody wants to wait. We want them right now, and I understand that. But at that moment in time, I had to weigh out my options. I had to really be smart. I had to strategically plan and think what would make sense and what would be wise. Because when I do things, even when I invest my money, I'm investing for long term, not short term. So with that being said, I had to invest my body, mind, and soul into boxing and knowing what I was getting into that I was going to be getting my head hit at times and stuff and understand that the head is not meant to be hidden in the first place. Your brain is never meant to be shooken. But I would risk my life for my daughter, as any parent should for their child to do any and everything for them, even if it's willing to die for them. And that's what I was willing to do. <laughs> And that's why I got into it. So with that being said, I took the path of taking the amateur because if I succeeded and made it to the point that I knew I could make it to, my money would triple, even double. Like I said, depending on how my career would go. And I can be able to support her a long term instead of short term. Let me and um, man, God is good. Let me ask you some questions about money. The Bronze Bomber, Nordic Nightmare, October 15th, Barclay Center in Brooklyn. Just a couple of quick, quick questions. The first money you made for a fight was blank. What was the, the very first money you made with your fists? What do you remember about it? Ah, oh, man. I try to go. I, I've had this question asked of me before, and I cannot, I can't think of my first. I know my 
I first my first professional fight was in in uh, in in in, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. I, I was fighting a Jermaine and Corey Spence card, and I think I made maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars. My first one, maybe three hundred thousand, something like that. I don't know. I, yeah, some up in that area. And what is the one that you remember looking at? The check that you remember looking at, or the direct deposit you remember looking at, and being like, "Holy shit." I, I can't believe my dreams have come true. Is it that one or another one? When I made my first million. And what it was you... over it was over a million, but that was my first million. I, when I became when I struck the millionaire, that was when I knew I made it. Because with that million, you know, sometimes people are like, what would you do with a million? You don't know what you would do with a million. I know what I do with that million. <laughs> and when I got my million, I immediately started investing. Immediately. Uh, let me ask you about the investment of money and what a dirty business it is. Because, uh, the, okay, let's start there. Don't that one, you dare. Th that one got your attention. <laughs> let's start there. Explain to us what a dirty business it is. Give us some of the examples because I can't imagine it's a good idea to try to steal money from you or try to get over on you. I think that's unwise. A dirty business in, in the boxing business? Yes, it is a dirty I mean, business. Yeah, it is. It is a dirty business. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, ah, you know, it's like, I love this business, though. I'm in this business because I signed up for it. And with behind this business, and when you sign up for it, in your mind, you have to understand that in this business, you are risking your life for others' entertainment. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're risking your life for others' entertainment. And in this business, there's going to be a lot of shady people, a lot of people that's going to try to get over on you. But there's going to be a lot of people in here that love you as well. You just got to know how to differentiate between the two and know how to feel the energy and the vibe and the aura and the things that comes around you. Because in this world, we not only have to be physically protected, but we have to be spiritually protected as well. And ask God for clarity and confirmation from all things and all human beings. Because in this business, you can have your brother, your uncle, your, your friend, your trainer, your manager, your prom you know, so many guys that will cross you in this business. But on the other side, you got so many that will love you. And that's the scary part about it. You don't know. You're just like weeding through. You got to, everybody is trying to get money every when you have a business that have the green eye monster you always got to stay clear you always got to be aware how often have of you your been surroundings and things how often you know, have you been burned how often have you been burned there or uh, or like or hurt i would say never mind burned just hurt where you're like oh man you too you too oh uh, man ah uh, ah uh. <laughs> um, man, I have to let it out. That's that's the only way that you can really understand and feel what I mean. Like ah, oh man. Just could, even th they say you never go back in the past to think about old things because you bring up old emotions, and old emotions is coming out of me. It just without words, it transforms into sound, and sometimes sound we can understand better than words. <laughs> I, I, the, the, the reason that I ask you the question, though, is because of the way that you described it, where you went through uh, family members, you went through trainers, people that you have to give your trust, and yeah. you feel like they love you, but you just don't know the temptations that are around every yeah. corner. Oh, uh, man. And that's the scary part about it. And that's and when it when in it, when the green eye monster is involved with anything, you got to be aware of all things, family, friends, foes. I mean, because money for the love of money is the root of all evil. And in this world, how we, how it's set up, they have us thinking that money we need money to do all things. And you know, really in this world, we need a lot of a lot of TLC. You know, and and but. Money will make a person change. Money will make a person that say they love you take from you. But in the same sentence, say they love you. You can have them around your children. You can fly them to many places, places that they've never been and never would have seen without you. You can pay for all the bills, all the expenses. And still, they had the audacity. They had the courage, the bravery to still take from you. Because they feel obligated or maybe they feel that you have reached a certain part of success in life that it ain't going to matter. He ain't got it. 
or maybe he won't even notice that it's gone. There's so many scenarios and situations and cases that have been formed, not only just with me, but others as well. And it's crazy because you just don't you just don't know who will get, you know, possessed. And their mindset changed into that formation of like, damn, I'm a steal for somebody that I say I love. I've looked them in their eyes and gave them hugs many times and maybe even cried. I love him, but I'm going to take from him. It's, it's a mess. It's a mess, man. And when you have those you can trust and those that say they really love you and you know they love you for sure, you hold them tight and you don't let them go. You hold them tight because when people say things to you, it's just like when I meet certain people or when they meet me. Because a lot of people, uh, you know, look at me and uh, their perspective of me is what they think I am in the ring. I am a beast in the ring. I have to transform to whoop some ass. And then after that, I come back to Deontay Wilder. And their perspective of me is thinking how I am and portray myself in the ring. I am that same character outside of the ring. But I am a man that understands intelligence. Although I'm from a small place, but that don't define my mind because my mind's so big a spaceship can fit in it. But I understand that that I'm in a world that my character riches for myself, what I believe in, what I stand for. Because if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And I stand for something, and I'm passionate about what I stand for and what I say. Especially when I speak for my people and all people. For I know that you may not remember my name, but you will never forget how I made you feel. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, do you so remember? You have, somebody, you have somebody that you can trust in this business, man. You got to hold on to them tight. And, and 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 I got a lot of those in there, too. I mean, it's a lot of dirt going on in this business, but it's a lot of good that come from it as well. You just got to weed out. You have to weave out the, the negative energy. And sometimes that takes years, you know, because you just certain people just change. As you grow, you have to still be observing around your surroundings and see where people grow with you because everybody um, ain't. Everybody's not meant to 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 grow with you. Everybody's not meant to 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 gain success with you. Certain people have certain points where they have to get off. My ship has finally come. Now it says instead of all aboard, is get the hell off. <laughs> you mentioned uh, you mentioned having to handle yourself or having confidence for handling yourself before you ever got into boxing. Do you remember when you lost the fear of fighting? I never had fear. I never had fear. Even the Bible said, have no fear, for thou rod, thou stop, but with me, thou comfort me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> so how I grew up, fighting was something of a regular. It was normal living for me. It's something that I knew if I if I enter, if I exit my home that these are this would be a consequence that I may face just uh, you know entering exiting my home and maybe go up the street whether I'm going to play basketball or get in the playground and swing or maybe walk down the street to the store at any given moment given given time you know mm -hmm. you can be a, a product of a situation where you ain't did nothing you don't want to bother no one you come in peace until somebody disturbed the peace and you had to you know, protect yourself. I always say I never look for trouble, but trouble always found me. Did you like because it? When did it, you like fighting? Did you, or, or did you, if you, have, if you have no fear of it, you didn't like fighting. I didn't like it at all. But my father didn't teach us to, 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 <coughs> to surrender or bow down to anyone. Although he was a, at that point in time, he was a minister. He's a pastor now. I always been a PK. But one thing about it, my dad, my dad always told me to take care of my, 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 my brothers and sisters, always protect them, never let harm come to them. And if it do, you shield them, protect and y'all work together. He always taught that to work together, love each other, work together, provide for each other. And that's what I teach my children, because in this cold world, it's a cold world. It'll, it'll, it'll eat you up and, and chew you and spit you out. And if you don't have no one to depend on and you, you're a lost soul. Professionally. So I always had to protect my brothers and sisters. And with that being said, and even with myself, I always had to defend myself. I always found myself in a great fight. And over the time, if you do certain things for so long, then how could you have fear to it? It's a normal thing. 
Uh, did you? So ever, it become coming. Have you fought very much professionally with hate in your heart? Not much. Not much. Not much at all. You know, I don't. I don't really uh, try to go in the ring with hate unless it's a personal issue with between me and that person or, or whatever. Or, or they've done some things that have uh, uh, they advanced themselves to do certain things or cheated me. Basically, you know, what I mean, I don't go with hate in my heart. You know, I don't even go in the ring mad. You know, I don't have to be mad. I don't have to have nothing on you to uh, to want to whoop that ass. You know, that comes with it. I open up that can and it just come on out. I mean, it's a business. And when I'm done, I go home to my family. You go home to yours and we've made it. We done beat the inevitable twice because it's already coming. But then we tried to we tried to give we tried to give it to them, too, by beating each other up. But we survived. And, uh, you know, it's a great thing. It's a great thing when you can go in, in the ring and uh, come out and survive. It's called surviving the jungle. It's a jungle in there. I didn't see, I I didn't see we, many uh, circumstances. Excuse me, Deontay. I did not see many circumstances. Because you've got such a, such a big right hand and because you have such size, I didn't think that the, uh, that the awkwardness of the gypsy street fighter, of course, I'm not fighting him. I don't understand what it's like to have the reach that he has and some of the advantages that he has, but it was unusual to see, uh, to see you uh, in a fight where you weren't manhandling somebody. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a lot of things come up there, you know what I mean? I only worry about the things that I control, and the things I can't control, you know, I do the best that I can. I don't worry about it for, you know, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, and there was a lot of things that was under my, that was uh, not under my control <laughs> with a lot of situations. But, you know, overall, it made me bigger, it made me stronger. Bad subject matter. I lost you. I was having such a good time talking to him, and I asked him a shitty question. I want to take it back. I want to take the question back, and and I'm going to ignore that it ever happened. Let's just put it aside because it was such a lovely conversation. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. The Bronze Bomber, the Nordic Nightmare. It's October 15th, Saturday, Barclay Center in Brooklyn. Why should they be watching? Why should they? Uh, why should this fight mean something to them? Uh, how do you feel about uh, about the Nordic Nightmare? I'm um, in Nordic Nightmare. Uh, Robert, I, uh, I personally feel he's a great guy. You know, he came to my camp many times. He didn't help me out. Uh, many times, and they say uh, uh, iron sharpens iron. So uh, we would had many sessions in there. And uh, one thing I like about Robert that um, he fights with his heart. I fight with my heart as well, you know. And uh, and that what controls the body. Your mind doesn't control the body. A lot of people think the mind controls the body. It doesn't. Your heart controls the body, because many times your mind can tell you to give up, quit. You can't do it. Then when people throw emotional garbage at you, you just you 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 let it sit up in your your your, your being, and then be like yeah, they said I can't do this, I can't do that, so you don't do nothing. But your heart, your heart to say I'll die for this, I'll die for what I believe in. I, I you know, so it, we both got heart of a, uh, we got warrior hearts, and it's gonna be an amazing fight when you got two warriors in there and fight with their hearts, and they're determined to win. You know, and uh, this is for the this is this is for the uh, WBC title eliminator, and also I I hear that uh, um, that if Robert uh, if he some if he if he is successful he's become the mandatory of Usyk belts, but I also heard Usyk would be there, and he said he want to fight the winner of this fight. So this is a huge fight. You know, it's a lot of titles on the line. Whether you're going for the WBC or whether you're going for the other or the four major belts all in one. Um, so this is a beautiful fight that has a lot on the line. And with a lot on the line, you know, yeah, man, the line got to come out of out at some point in time. Whatever the spirit animal are you, it got to come out because that's when it counts. And this is so much on the line. And Robert has never been to this place before, like I have, I've been on the top for a very long time. You know, I endeavor so much. I obtained so much success and uh, obtained so much glory from it, you know, where my life is beautiful. On the other hand, he haven't tasted before. He haven't been in these territories before. So he's seeking to become this and seek it uh, and, 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 and to gain greatness. And 
here I am to come in my second reign and continue to gain greatness as well because I understand how many people I motivate and, and, and inspire. Some people live up to every word that I say. So I'm very important. I have to watch what I say at times, but I only can speak my piece. I'm the realest. I'm Fox. the bronze bummer, one of the baddest men on the planet. And, and, and with this fight, it's going to be amazing. I can't wait. Two giants that's determined, that got, or that got a warrior heart, a warrior spirit, and a warrior mindset. Man, this is a fight that you don't want to miss because when the bronze bomber is in the ring and in action, you know you can't sit. You can't sit just on, uh, on the... You have to sit on the edge of your seat. You can't go nowhere. Don't go to the bathroom. You can't even go to the concession stand and get your favorite hot dog or pizza <laughs> because you don't know when it's going to happen, but you know it's going to happen. And when it happens, bam, baby, good night. Fox Sports PBC pay-per-view. It is being headlined by Deontay Wilder, and he's fighting Robert Hellenius, uh, the Nordic Nightmare. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it, Deontay. Good catching up with you, sir. Oh, uh, man, anytime, brothers. And I hope you guys have a wonderful and blessed day. For me, for most, me, it's like the most. flip side. I would say, how many baseball players, if they were sitting in this room, you would recognize would you your know? appearance? Right. I, um, I'd say it's probably like two dozen. You would know John that? Peterson, right? If John no. Peterson strolled into this no. into the studio right now, I could wake up next to Paul Goldschmidt. Wouldn't know it. <laughs> He's won an MVP. I could wake up next to him. Would not know. I'd be like, who's this? Who's this dude? <laughs> How many would we know? Lindor, we'd know him, right? I would not, I would I would not, not know, know Fran Lindor. Francisco no? Lindor. No. I would not know him. I guess I've been watching the Mets lately, so I would know him. I would know. Right? I would know yeah. Scherzer because he has two different color eyes. We know, yeah. right? I know, I know Verlander. Yeah. yeah, Aaron Judge is an easy one. Yeah. Stanton's an easy one. Yeah, yeah. 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 got those big guys. Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, I don't know what Manny Machado Kershaw. looks like. Oh, I know what Manny looks I would, like. I would say yeah, Kershaw. Yeah, Kershaw. I think Machado would, would walk in. Batiste. You think it's Machado, but you're not I would know certain Machado. it's Machado. I would know Machado. I would know Machado for sure. Yeah. But Batiste, he would have to say I'm Manny Machado. Right? I would know Tatis. I would know Machado. I would probably know Juan Soto. I have a, a, mm. I have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the San Diego mm. Padres, apparently. Mm. Gambling again? Mm. Yeah, I'm gambling again. That's right. We'd know Mike Trout at this point, right? I think so. Bryce Harper? You'd know. I would know Otani. Why? I would know. Uh, I would know Trout. Right. That team sucks. I, <laughs> they have oh, two. They so have two money. of the guys you would know, and they're so awful. Oh, I saw. I saw another Tungsten O'Doyle stat last night on the uh, on on the Los Angeles Angels. I think Mike Trout hit another home run. Shohei Otani like struck out some number of players, and they lost two to one to the worst team in the American League. All right, here it is. The Angels just completed a seventy three and eighty nine season, despite having arguably two of the best players to ever compete. Both Trout and Otani had incredible years. Otani had the best season ever by anyone. At the final game of the season was like many before it. Otani pitched five innings and allowed one run. Trout hit a four hundred ninety foot homer. The Angels lost to the worst team in the American League three to two. <laughs> Trout's. Trout's found his power lately. Yeah, he has. Well, the season's over now. A little now. too late. Yeah. No, but yeah, yeah. I'm saying he's found it to the degree that you could actually have the conversation about him catching I some dare of the all-time greats. any one of you to name the Major League Baseball leader in batting average right now. I dare you. Ooh, well, uh, he's a Minnesota League, twin. National League, I know. Really? He's a, he's well, Jeff McNeil. Yeah. Right. Who that, the well, hell is that guy? Yeah. He's a Matt. Yes. He's a Matt, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah he's, he's a second baseman for the Mets. He I'm leads me. Again. No, he, there, he I'm leads me to the, the Mets baseball. again. <laughs> is there a, an Alvarez? Is there an Alvarez? <laughs> There's an Arias. Oh, yeah. I knew it had an A. Minnesota? Yeah. Minnesota, the last name A. That's uh, I feel like yeah, I get it. I'm going to have a half point. I give you the full point on that. Yeah. The only reason I know about him was because it was an Aaron Judge alert. They were like, well, I guess you could watch this guy get the batting title. Yeah. I was like, who the hell is that guy? I literally <laughs> found this out yesterday. Didn't retain his name. Would we know Freddie Freeman if no. he walked into the I studio? I wouldn't know all. a single wow. reigning World Series champion. Wow. Yeah. We'd know Pujols. Uh, I, I wouldn't know Acuna. I wouldn't know Acuna. Would you know Springer? A Springer Dinger? No. But once he told me Altuve, that he said, though, we'd know. Altuve, if if George know. Springer said, hey, I'm George Springer, I'd be like, oh, Springer Dinger. Springer and I would Dinger, move on, right. living the rest of my life. Right. <laughs> That's what you have to say. Yeah. Right. I would know Jose Altuve. I might know Jordan Alvarez. I, I, How about man. Pete Alonzo? How about Adam yeah, Wainwright? Maybe. maybe. Still out here doing it. Adam Wainwright? No. He's got one of those faces that is just... Face blindness. Yeah. So. It, right. They all look the same. I could, I could try to draw... I, if I tried to draw... 
Adam Wainwright from memory, it would look the same as Matt Carpenter. Yes. It would look the same as Paul Goldschmidt. Yes. It would right. basically look the same as any white St. Louis Cardinal ever. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Matt yeah. Holiday. Matt mm-hmm. Holiday. Yeah. No, I could pick him out. You could you pick know, him out. It's oddly a jawline, shaped head. Though. It was his head. Yeah. John Mabry. He had a bigger head. He had like one of those Polanco heads. How about Mookie Betts? Uh, yeah. 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 I'd recognize Mookie Betts. Yeah. I'd recognize Mookie Betts. Balding. Bellinger, no. I would not know. Trey Turner, no. I'm just looking at like Justin Leader, Turner. Leaders in statistical categories. So am I. And there's so many names where it's like, first off, there's a player named Whit Merrifield. Don't know who that, that is. I mean, that sounds like, no he, idea. That sounds like he has money. You made that name up. Would you know Hosmer? No. No. I would. What if he was wearing a Royals uniform? Only if he was wearing a Royals <laughs> uniform and then several teams were moved at Him this point. Him and Salvador Perez. <laughs> I'm sorry to baseball fans for how actively and aggressively ignorant this show is what about, about oh, baseball. Oh, my God. I mean, Mike's having a heart bets, attack. Stu Gods. Like some of the sport. people. Some Ask of me the to name some Portland on, Timbers man. by appearance. Yeah. I could do that for you. Yeah. What do you Dan, mean? would you recognize Paul Goldschmidt if you woke up next I to him? I would, but only because That's I would. That's debatable. No, Freddie Freeman? I would no. because I have. Because it's happened. You've woken up next to Paul Goldschmidt's? Scottsdale. He was a sweet lover, and we had just a wild, wild night. Lake Havasu. We reconnected after he did a terrible interview with us when I demanded that he, because he, he apologized for being boring. He apologized, and I said, well, just make up a story about, like, you were chased by a bear, and he's like, I'm so sorry. I'm not creative like that, but I'm going to be a Hall of Famer. Uh, and I mash, and I'm going to be MVP. And I'm really great. And the best teams in baseball are really great. Like, I have watched uh, way too much Marlins baseball this year because the skill level is crazy. It's just nuts. And your team is good, Stugatz, and 100 wins isn't quite good enough. No. Because the Braves are also great. But I wanted to talk to you guys about something that happened in sports yesterday. And people are jumping to a lot of conclusions. Draymond Green seems really unpleasant to work with. Draymond Green seems to have a fuel of fury that can help sharpen a champion. Both those things can be true. The thing burned out in Golden State when it was Kevin Durant and Draymond Green. Draymond Green, everyone has said, you just got to get used to. He's going to be screaming at everybody. Andre Guadala on our network is saying he's not here for any Jordan Poole slander as people are looking at the three-point contest in Tokyo making something of Clay's words that he and Steph beat Jordan Poole kept him humble that Jordan Poole needs some humbling but he doesn't need some humbling he wants some of the same things the old guys on that team want and he's also great and Draymond Green inside of that locker room is old guard and Jordan Poole's Got his money, right? Like, they've got to decide. They've got to decide here between Jordan Poole, between Clay, between Draymond on who they're going to give the money on that team. And now they're getting into a fight. I don't know what's going on for real there, but they're getting into a fight on the court, chest to chest. And I don't know if it's that moment of emotion or if we're reaching the point where Draymond Green, who's been buddy-buddy with LeBron, and he's he's doing a lot of publicity, it seems like, for all LeBron things. I don't know where Draymond's career is going to end up. I do know that Draymond thinks he's the furnace at the center of that team. And I don't think he's wrong. Oh, I'm totally with Draymond Green. Like, I think Draymond Green is the centerpiece of that team. He gives them the toughness, the defense, all the intangible stuff that you love and that that team probably needs because of Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. They're not guys who are going to do that. He does the little things, Dan, and he's very important to that team. Well, they are better no, with no, him no, than without him. They don't need another Jordan Poole, another Steph Curry. They do need a Draymond Green. I, I disagree. They, they they needed Wiggins and Poole to win at the end. They, okay. They, like they, you, they I mean, you right. struggled in the finals. No, but, but Poole they did needed have Wiggins. some big games in the postseason. Yeah, he did. They, they, yes. they, they, they've got to decide between yeah, all of those Denver guys. that Denver series, they certainly needed Poole. Yeah. Wiggins is somebody else, though, that it also is, a, is about to cash in. And they can't pay all of them, even though they don't mind about the luxury tax. They're light years ahead of everybody. But let's identify the workplace conflict, because it's not really allowed in any other workplaces. It's not a normal part of doing business. Hey, we all have a coworker who just likes to scream at everybody. Not in this age. Not in toxic workplace climate age. We know that that's a pressure cooker that is different than other workplaces. 
But what happens when, before the season has even started, there are reports that Draymond and Jordan Poole got into it at practice when Stugatz consistently, I've been telling you, I, for, for 30 years, we make too much of these sideline incidents and loving the soap opera thing because these people work in a different world than we do. And right. so workplace conflict is normal. Athletes get to ESPN and they don't understand why everyone's just not tougher. Like, like just, just because they get beat up and they got to do survival of the fittest shit. And they're not insecure about some of the same dumb shit that we in the vanity business are insecure about. It could just be, you know, one of those moments in practice where Draymond Green is always going a thousand miles per hour. Jordan Poole's not in the mood for it. No one's in the mood for it. And Draymond and Poole get in a little fight. It could, Dan, it could be something as benign as that. But That's it, what happens but, but so in what, professional but, but sports. What not, you say it's what happens in professional sports, and so do I. But what if it's a champion and Draymond Green is one of the most polarizing people in all of sports and Draymond Green has made himself vastly more famous and has a larger platform as he starts playing planning what his brand is going to be at the end of his career. And Draymond's got a bigger microphone. He's got a bigger uh, bigger ego. And outside of Dennis Rodman, no one in the history of the sport who does what Draymond Green does gets to be as famous as Draymond Green is. Even though he's great at defense. it's There's no such thing. It's him and Rodman. And look at what Rodman had to do to get that kind of fame. And Draymond's like, nope, I'll do it my way. Draymond's a guy, statistically, th there's nothing there. Nothing. Now, he's... He's, he might be a damn well unprecedented defensive player. Yeah, but, he's a Hall of Famer. But we're not celebrating him. His fame is not because of that. Ben Wallace doesn't get that fame. They're, his fame is because he's a big mouth, and he's his brand is good, and his ego is big, and he doesn't mind saying things no one else will say, and now Jordan Poole ran up against it, and and Draymond, it, the way the reports are is that, Dr that Draymond hit Jordan, not the, that Draymond faces disciplinary action, not Jordan Poole. Does it matter? Michael Jordan punched Steve Kerr in the face when they were teammates. Does it matter, any of it? No. I think it does, just because Draymond seems to only be able to do this one way. That's what I'm fascinated by, is that Draymond Green seems to think that after having been the 35th overall pick and having been mostly ignored until Steve Kerr sort of happened upon a lineup that worked for him, and then he established his career, and he moved forward in his career in this one particular way, that he's only capable of doing it this one particular way. And we cannot act like Draymond Green acting this way hasn't had collateral damage. It cost them the, 26, uh, the, the, the 2016 championship. It cost them probably keeping Kevin Durant, depending on how you view how that situation played out. There, there has been some collateral damage as a result. But Golden State and Draymond Green continue to think that this is the only way that he can be the preserver of culture, and this is the only way for him individually to be successful as a basketball player. They won a championship after Durant left, so I don't know how much that factors in. But, like, what are you saying? It affects the team how? Like, the, the Warriors aren't going to be good well, because no, he, Jordan he, Poole no, and the, Draymond what, what Green? What he said is he got suspended and they lost. It's no, one of the that biggest, I know, but okay. he's also helped them win but a Scott, lot of games. But, Scott's in one of the biggest upsets in the history of the sport, in a game seven scenario where Draymond Green scored 32 points in the game, but got a, he got ejected because he can't control it sometimes. He costs them a championship, period, by getting suspended. I understand that, but he's also helped them win four championships. So, I mean... Correct. Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is that there is collateral damage here. You can't universally say that Dray, like the way that Draymond Green goes about his business is universally good for the Warriors. I'm not saying it it's is, great. It has been most of the time, but I do think there are times where he's come up against it, and they've, they've got to figure some stuff out there. Okay, I'm not saying it's great, but in terms of wins and losses this season, that little scuffle yesterday at practice is going to mean what in the grand scheme Stugatz, of things? Nothing. I, Stugatz, you say, I don't know, but you say Durant left. Because they had something, and it was with Draymond, and and Durant Durant did leave. You say it might cost them nothing. It did cost them Durant, and I'm not saying it's going to cost them Pool. I'm interested in examining. We'll get to Mike Schur in a second here because I'm interested in his opinion as well. I used to have this conversation with baseball closers who threw 100 miles an hour and their hand would be shaking after the game trying to drink water because of whatever whatever the adrenaline or amphetamines or whatever it is of not of having to go to this place. John Rocker talked about it. Go to this place where there, it was furious and angry to go get the energy to throw 100 miles an hour. Draymond seems to play from there, and I don't know if he can always control it as I'm watching his Hulu special where he does deep dives on the mechanics of his mind and does like therapy sessions 
because he's interested in being interesting far beyond basketball, but I don't think he's got total control of this thing. And I do think he thinks it serves him so he doesn't have to put it in check because Durant's gone. And Jordan Poole, if you don't want to be here, you could leave too. I got Steph and Clay. We've won championships. We don't need any, but we don't need any of you. I can understand why he is he arrived. wrong to view it that way. Well, where but, hey, Durant the, left, we got Wiggins and Poole, and it, we still want at a title. At every turn, at every right. turn, his mo has been reinforced. Yes, uh, except in the and won a title mm, before Durant. Mm, mm, yeah. mm. No, but I'd stop you here. At every turn, it's being reinforced. But now there's money, and four guys want it, True. and they can't give it to everybody. One of and, them's nine years younger. And now that now you get into the cutthroat parts of the business. Let's see if Golden State values Draymond the way you think they should, the way Draymond thinks they should, as he fights with Jordan Poole. Jordan Poole wants that money. Well, let's see if Steph values Draymond the way I think Steph does value Draymond. Oh, but that's a cutthroat business, Stugatz. Like the, he's the old guy, and the other guys are... Man, Wiggins, <laughs> those guys are much younger. I know. But Steph's done a lot of winning with Draymond Green by his side. Is that the edge that Draymond keeps with now his offensive efficiency and just everything offensively just kind of, kind of gone down the tank? He's a liability out there on the offensive side. Is he using this edge to stay in the in the lineups? This aging process, as we talk about Russell Wilson aging, Draymond Green playing that way, that physically, Stugatz, it'll age you at the end of the machine. They might oh, not respect a champion with the money the way that champion expects to be respected. Mike Scher, what do you think of all of this? A big, uh, big nothing? This happens in the sports workplace or something? Something. Draymond Green and, uh, and Jordan Poole uh, having a fight that might end with Draymond Green's discipline. No, it's something. I... I... I was just enjoying the thought that maybe the Warriors would let Draymond go and then he would take his act to like the Orlando Magic or something. (laughs) Like (laughs) how much sadder that would be if he were out there screaming at refs and like getting in people's faces, but he's playing for the (laughs) 20 and 48 Orlando Magic. Like that, I think the reason that he has the, he's always had the safety of the rest of the guys on his team being great. In order to like he who are like when it's Steph Curry and Durant and Clay Thompson holding you back and trying to calm you down, like it looks a lot better than if it's a bunch of randos. I I also I can you can't help but enjoy the idea of a guy becoming cartoonishly personality driven when he's Bo Outlaw surrounded by the greatest shooters you've ever seen. (laughs) I'm the reason we win or the guys who shoot better than anyone anyone's ever imagined. Man, we're forgetting series in which Draymond Green playoff series averaged 22 and a half points a game, 12 rebounds, seven and a half assists, two steals. And J.R. Smith did it too. Because it's, it's been a while. It's, it was a long time ago. And Del- I understand. And Del- but Mikey Del- had big games last year during that run. He did. It's not that he's never. Of course, he did. He's great. He's going to the Hall of Fame. It's, though it's, it's not that he's well, not a good goes player. To that it's hall it's of just thing. that it's it's just that it's funny. His whole thing. He's weirdly like Tom Brady. His whole thing is there's a chip on his shoulder. He was overlooked. No one. He did, wasn't drafted in the lottery. He was. He's a late round or a late pick. That's his whole. That's where he goes to. That's the that's the wellspring whence he draws his his fire and his the the fire in his belly, and it's not that that is bad necessarily. It's just that I think Dan is right. It's like they, like that team isn't what it has been without him. But also without him, it might have been something else that was also great because he has screwed up a lot of stuff for them. He kicked a guy in the penis, as Chris Whittingham would say, and got suspended from the finals. Like that's a really bad. That's a, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, five, yeah, five, five dollars. Yeah, five dollars. <coughs> <coughs> Choked him up. Ten dollars. And pay your money's worth. Fifteen dollars. This is a safe space. Mm-hmm. And he also, uh, he also just punched one of his teammates in the face. Like that's that's not. It doesn't matter if you're great. Like when you do stuff like that, it it will destroy the fabric of your team slowly over time. If I were if I were Steph or Clay, wouldn't I be sick of it by now? That's the other thing. Aren't they like rolling their like we're all in our mid thirties now? Like, really? We're and, they're, still... they're so, and they're so different than him. Just in uh, they yeah. seem so different from him. In temperament. Yeah, but they love him. Uh, yeah, and you can. They love do, him. but also, wouldn't they w- like if you if he's he's been doing the same exact thing for like twelve years now? Like, I, it's pra- he's in practice. It's preseason practice, and he's punching Jordan Poole in the face. I don't know. I just but you don't you don't I think, think that I'd everyone there like, thinks it's necessary? I think that that's why everyone still puts up with it. Is that I do think that like Steve Kerr, the organization, the star players sort of feel like they need that. 
on October 5th in practice? Like, Why not? Yeah, set the tone. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jordan Poole walks in with a little swagger, thinking he's the reason they won a title last year. And Draymond's like, hey, we won before you. We we'll went after you. Who cares? That's a very conventional media spin that uh, Clutch has put out there through one of their agents and Chris Haynes, um, which is, we talked about it some in the local hour with David Samson. For all that new media stuff, Draymond's playing some old media games right now. Yes, he is. Uh, wait, before we get to the stat of the day, Mike, as a world-renowned ethicist, what is the sports media and the public at large entitled to in the Brady-Giselle um, divorce, divorce lawyers being reported? Like, what are we entitled to? What shows the most grace? What, uh, what can they expect from a public that's going to see the Shakespearean elements of this? I mean, we're entitled to nothing, to know absolutely nothing about any of these people's personal lives, entitled being the key operative word here, the amount that we know is always far too much it, because people unethically who are close to the situation in some regard or another end up leaking things to the media. Friends of, friends of celebrities leak things for money, which is about the least ethical thing you can do to a friend. Um, and people who work in hospitals leak medical information to TMZ. I mean, the, this is the where the rubber meets the road, ethically speaking, in terms of what the public has a right to know, even in a country that purports to have a free press, versus what we end up knowing. Um, we're entitled to nothing. That's, that's the simple answer. And yet we will undoubtedly learn horrifying details, not horrifying like bad treatment of anyone or anything, but simply things that we shouldn't know about uh, the inner workings of a marriage. Uh, we will certainly learn stuff if we choose to by the end of, by the time this is over. And that's awful. Like it doesn't matter who these people are. They have a right to privacy and their celebrity doesn't make them fair game or it doesn't make it open season on their personal lives. It, oh, this part always bums me out whenever people are going through something that has nothing to do with sports or the modeling industry. Like you can have an active interest in either of these two people based on their careers. And that does not in any way mean that you get to know things that are happening behind closed doors in their lives. And it, uh, and they have kids. I mean, it's just going to be awful. It's going to be terrible. I'm not, I'm not really not looking forward to the next wave of media stuff that happens around this circus. And so what am I supposed to do as someone in the content business when this arrives with these elements and you've got the greatest winner ever, but, uh, but he doesn't, uh, <laughs> the, the choice seems to be whatever it is, because you can't, you can't look at what is happening with their brands and what it is that both of them have said about their marriage and that she wants him home. And I can't help but want to comment on that, even though it makes me uncomfortable just because it ceases to be about them. And the what an eternal, unbelievable thing to look at, the idea that uh, most people listening to this would want to be Tom Brady at work forever. Yeah, and I mean, add to that, you're talking about two of the most successful people ever, the most successful football player ever, perhaps you could say the most successful model ever. I'm not sure how you would necessarily calculate that. You're talking about two incredibly rich people, two incredibly famous people, two incredibly handsome people, um, people whose celebrity is like it, it seems to extend backwards in time forever and feels like it will extend forward in time forever. And so when there's a problem in their lives, of course, your instinct is to like think about it and talk about it, investigate it, discuss it. But it doesn't have anything to do with anything. I mean, you could find an angle on this, right? You could say, OK. Tom Brady um, has been a guy who a couple times has thought about retiring clearly and has then tried to like pull an insane deal, rabbit out of a hat where he fake retired, was given part of the Dolphins, went to the front office, came out of retirement, voided a contract. Like all of that stuff is fair game to talk about because it's on the field and it has to do with his career. And adjacent to that and connected to that, is the idea that maybe his wife in the past has talked about wanting him to to come home sooner or end his career sooner. And so you're in this gray zone where there's an issue that's related to his on-the-field activities, but is also related to this other aspect of his personal life. And then the question is, where do you draw the line in terms of what's fair game to talk about? Who knows? I have no idea. I just know that I don't want to... It, it feels like one of those things where 
We are all speculating wildly. We're just guessing. We're pretending that we have any understanding of their marriage, which we definitely don't. And so I would prefer just to never talk about any aspect of anything other than his on the field performance or how handsome he is. Because I do enjoy talking about how handsome he is. Time now for the stat of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day. It is the start of the day. Well, folks, as you know, I desperately want to be fired, and nothing I try <laughs> has worked. So I have a new strategy. Let's talk soccer, baby. Here we go, specifically. Oh, oh no. It's a good day. Yeah, we're going to talk about Erling Haaland. This is going to backfire. This is yeah. going to backfire a, on you, Mike. We had a blast talking Erling, soccer Mike. earlier. Yeah. Surprise, no hockey. Yeah. A hockey's coming, but right now we're going to talk about Erling Haaland. Oh, who is no. a 22 year old, six foot four inch tall Norwegian soccer monster who joined the Premier League this year? Might end up shattering every record ever set. His dad was a soccer player. His mom was a Norwegian heptathlon champion. So this guy was essentially grown in a lab to dominate sports. He scored two more Champions League goals yesterday. He plays for Whittingham's favorite team, Manchester City. And he scored two more Champions League goals yesterday, which makes 28 goals in 22 Champions League games against the top competition in the world. He is like top 30 all time in Champions League scoring. By the time this Champions League is over, he could be top 20 all time. He's 22 years old. This is preposterous. It's hard to explain if you don't follow soccer how preposterous this is. It is roughly equivalent to a wide receiver having like 80 touchdown catches at age 22. This guy has the craziest stats. He has more goals in the Premier League this year than 14 teams. He has three hat tricks in eight games, which is a record. The old record was three hat tricks in 48 games. <laughs> but here is the actual stat of the day. It's not apples to apples because they played in different leagues. But Erling Holland, at 22 years old in all competitions that he's played in has 175 goals. At the same age, Cristiano Ronaldo had 50 and Messi had 44. <laughs> he has more than three times as many goals at age 22 as Cristiano Ronaldo and almost four times as many as Leo Messi. Please fire me. Uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> Give him a raise. Uh, we'll say, well, you have delighted us. You have titillated us. We will not fire you uh, tomorrow. Soccer stats and other stats with Mike Schur. Thank you, sir. Can I tell you one more thing about this guy? Because I'm obsessed with him now. He has... He has uh, in the under-20 World Cup, he once scored nine goals in one match. And in his first game ever at Dortmund in the Bundesliga, <laughs> Undersold it. He, came on, he came on at halftime and he scored a hat-trick in 23 minutes in his first game playing in the German league. He came on at halftime and had a hat-trick 23 minutes later. <laughs> See you later, Mike. I'm pretty sure that I have this right, that the Sally Yates report, 319 pages that uh, chronicles uh, just systemic abuse throughout women's soccer that concentrates on three coaches, but really is an indictment of a whole lot of the power structure. I think all of this started with the reporting of Meg Lenahan a year ago, because I read a story from September 30th of 2021. I don't know how long before that she'd been working on this story for The Athletic, but I believe that's where all of this started. And Meg Lenahan joins us now from London. Meg, thank you. Uh, explain to us how it is that you got involved with the work on this story and how long you've been doing the journalism around this story, because uh, what you've done is pretty exhaustive and you must feel as good as you can feel, given that this report seems to validate uh, that there's a problem that badly needs fixing in women's soccer and beyond. Yeah, I, I first got the call from the two players who wanted to go public with their own NWSL and honestly before that WPS, the previous pro league, their experiences um, playing for former head coach Paul Riley. That first call came in, I want to say around May. So I've been working on the story for about six months. It was not, I think that there were a number of other reports. Molly Hensley Clancy at the Washington Post has done 
a number of stories on other coaches, including the Washington Spirit, which we also did reporting around them, Chicago Red Stars, OL Reign. Uh, again, to your point, it is not a, a one coach only or a one team. It, there is a systemic problem, but really I think a lot of the the major fallout came after my story at the Athletics simply because that was kind of, I think, the worst of the worst. So. Well, go through for the audience, please, if you don't mind, the details that spawned. Again, a 319-page report by a former United States Attorney General that uh, it's appalling. There's no way of reading these words and not being really bothered by uh, the, the, the abuses that these players had to endure from leadership figures, respected leadership figures. Yeah, I mean, so for the, the story that I wrote a year ago, roughly, is it was really two players who played under head coach Paul Riley. One of them, Shane Fairley, had experiences and, and alleged that Paul Riley had sexually coerced her on multiple occasions, also a teammate as well at the same time. And Mana Shim had an experience with Portland Thorns in 2015 where he began to target her and try to isolate her at film training sessions, restaurant, you know, out drinking. I, there's a number of cultural issues here. And so I think when you then go into the second half of this, where it is maybe a little bit less about individual player experiences and then into the institutional failures that are happening, that was another, honestly, very important part of the story that we really needed to tell at The Athletic is that for all of the attempts that these two players made at reporting bad behavior, both Monashim at the time in 2015 to her club team, Portland, and the league itself, and then also in 2021 to then Commissioner Lisa Baird of the NWSL at trying to raise that there was information that was new, they were ignored. And so this is, I think, the bigger conversation that we're having around the NWSL is that these reporting mechanisms did not work for about a decade. And that is what we have seen now with Sally Yates' report is that there was a report about Paul Riley being a head coach in the NWSL every single year between 2014 and 2021 that should have raised a red flag for someone and nothing ever happened until the story went public on September 30th, 2021. How does that happen? How do so many people know when nothing gets done? I mean, I think that's a big question that we're asking about human nature honestly at the moment but i you know one of the more logistical reasons is that there is both ignorance and then active malice at play here in terms of covering things up and and setting things aside and allowing coaches to leave and issuing press releases that wish them the best of luck on the way out the door and so they're able to get hired in another place but there's also this logistical thing of the club thinks that the league is going to be responsible the league thinks that u.s soccer which was for Seven years of the league, its actual manager, U.S. Soccer, was managing NWSL from 2013 until 2020. And then U.S. Soccer, being safe sport, might tackle things. So there's a lot of finger pointing. So there's there's elements of, again, just people not doing the right thing, but also then people thinking that other people are going to do the right thing, or it's not their responsibility to report it, or someone's going to take care of it, or it's an open secret. It's disappointing on honestly, every single level of it. And and that's very much the institutional failure. I do want to ask about the systemic failure in terms of the relationship between male coaches and female players in the women's game and also just in general in women's soccer. Why do you think this is so pervasive that this isn't just the case of one bad coach? It seems like over the course of a year, it's like every NWSL team, I think bar one, changed their coach over the space of a year because a lot of things are being found out about a lot of coaches. What do you think is the systemic issue at play both at professional level and also the report gets into uh, some issues at youth level as well? Yeah, I mean, the youth part is such a heat. It, the behavior gets normalized at the youth level, whether it's the verbal abuse or boundaries getting lowered, right? Like that is that is something that so many players have spoken about in terms of coming in from the youth level and just thinking that this is normal. And so when it happens in the pro environment, they don't even think to report it. In the Sally Yates report, 70% of the Chicago Red Stars basically reported abusive behavior and some of them didn't even realize it was abusive behavior. And that comes from the youth level. Now, one other part that I want to follow up on what you said is that male coaches, female players, but I think it actually goes beyond that. I think male coaches obviously have a 
track record here in a lot of this reporting, but it is not a gender thing. It's a power thing, in my opinion. And that might intersect with the gender element in some cases, and especially obviously in the sexual coercion parts of it, but it boils down to power imbalances and how people who have power use it because there are instances where female coaches can abuse that power as well, a hundred percent. So I think it, it kind of is going to force us to ask the question of like, what is acceptable behavior between a coach and a player and not just in women's soccer, not just in the NWSL, but I think from a sports perspective, right. Is, is yelling at a player productive and a good thing to do. And that's one of the things that the NWSL has been grappling with for over a year. And obviously it goes, there's a lot of stuff that's way worse than just verbal abuse, but that that's going to be one of the, the things that comes out of this that could affect other sports. But fundamentally for me, it's about the power of it. You've been asking yourself some of these questions for more than a year now. How many questions did the Sally Yates report answer for you? I think a lot when it came to specifics, right? I think that was, you know, I've been asked a lot, like, was there anything surprising to you? And, I, you know, from a overall point of view, I think it just reaffirmed so much of the reporting. And obviously there was so much of our actual, the details of our reporting that got confirmed in that report, which I think was reassuring. But I just think that ultimately there's so much kind of fundamental work that has to be done. And players are so aware that there's just it, the scope of the problem. It goes so far beyond this, you know, 319 page report. Right. And Sally Yates had, had said, writes that in the report too, of just their, my scope was limited to the NWSL. She only focused on three coaches. Yeah, it's just, I, I, I should, yeah, I should say Louisville, Christy Holly, Portland, Paul yes. Riley, Chicago, uh, Rory Dames. But you're saying that this is not only systemic for women's soccer, it's youth soccer, it's all of it, that there needs to be a cultural overhaul on the entire pipeline because it's people being abused that don't even know they're being abused in some instances. Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing it, you know, I, I don't particularly cover men's soccer, but I, I followed, you know, one of the lower division leagues, the USL, and we've seen stories about abusive coaching behavior in that league as well, right? And players, the their players association just had to make a statement to step in and say, this is not being handled in a way that we think is appropriate and, and good enough. So it's not limited to women's sports by any sort. I mean, when I think about the stories that, my male friends or my dad has said about the coaching environments that they have experienced in sports, verbal abuse is just 1000% uh, normalized compared to women's soccer. But, but that's also, we're talking about sexual misconduct here though, right? We yes. can't, we, we shouldn't be conflating the two on toxic work environments and we really should. I mean, we can have a conversation about whether coaches are helping when they're yelling at kids and that yelling is normal and power imbalances are normal, but the sexual misconduct is, uh, it is the most problematic of what we're talking about here. And right. when, when you read the report giving you those details and furthermore, the, uh, the amount of dating and commonalities, power imbalances, all the things that happen when a, when a young woman is learning from a, a coach who can abuse that power, what can you tell us about the problems in the mechanics of the pipeline that allows, uh, allows the coaches and authority figures to be, uh, to be predators? I mean, I think to your point, right, like this is where the power and the gender part comes in because coaches who act as if they have control over women's bodies, right? Like with Paul Riley, so many players told me, okay, we're playing a sport, right? This is a, uh, our jobs are dependent upon what our bodies can physically do. So it feels normal for a coach to say, I have to know what you're eating. I have to know what you're, how you're working out. I need to know your weight. And so that then is that kind of foundational step that then helps them lower boundaries that enables other behavior, right? And it's in environments. Like we've seen so many reports of coaches living in the same spaces as players, right? Which I think at least on some level has stopped, but it's that, that boundary issue where you push and you push and you push until finally 
it enables kind of that ultimate betrayal of the coach player relationship. But that doesn't happen without that sort of hot and cold behavior of using the coaching relationship to say, Hey, you're going to make the national team. If I coach you, right. Your performance is going to be good. I need to, I need to know about your body. I need to be in charge of you. And then that's the, the grooming behavior that unlocks everything else. Where else can you find these manipulations in the details of the reporting and the report where it becomes obvious that uh, beyond dating pool stuff, that there are manipulations and the system is not only encouraging the manipulations in some ways, it's masking them by, by ignoring women who are saying, hey, isn't this wrong? And going to the proper protocols to tell people about it and still ignored for years and years, making them yet more hel helpless and crushed under the system. Yeah, I mean, I think the other really important contextual part for this, too, is when you think about when the NWSL was formed in 2013. Three federations come together and say, hey, we're going to basically play for national team players. We'll, we'll pay for league functions, right? The name of the game was this league survival. We had two previous women's professional leagues that had failed. So you have this landscape where players are grateful for a place to, to play, uh, understandably. But what happens is that one of the really important things to understand is that this culture of silence was rewarded at every level. Because if you were the player that spoke out about a bad training environment or an abusive coach, you could be gone the next week, right? You have no job security in this place. And I think also the other part is like the boundaries are so much lower in women's soccer because of the lack of professionalism that Christy Holly is walking in as a volunteer coach. Rory Dames is walking in as an unpaid coach, right? They don't have the right coaching licenses. So you combine those two things again, and then this is where you end up in a space where you can have these relationships, right? Where if, if they're coming into the state, Christy Holly, especially I think about everything that's described about his experience is that he comes in kind of as like, almost like a friend to the players and then gets put into an authority position. So those boundaries are in a very different space than someone getting hired and vetted to come in as a head coach. So there's there's just so many layers to this. And again, like we're talking about a 319 page document, right? From the smallest details to the bigger systemic parts of it, there's just it's just such a nuanced way of how this got built in a way that rewarded silence and complicity. It's crazy to say, though, Meg, that a 319-page report from a former United States Attorney General is really not even tip of the iceberg. What you're saying is you're reading that report and you're like, yep, 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 obvious, yep, 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 just confirmation of yep, 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 we've known this is so for 10 years and now how do we fix it? Because what a mountain this is to fix all of it, because you're talking about the entire pipeline. I mean, I think one of the, the parts that I have really tried to hold on to for I, right since September 30th, 2021, is that the NWL or women's soccer in general, right? The heart and soul of it is the players and what the NWL players and, and everyone associated with it, like what we should be putting at the heart and center of the game is the players and their health and safety. And that's where we have to not necessarily burn the entire thing down but try to take it down to the barest of bones that we can possibly get it and then rebuild the entire thing. Right. And so there's both, yeah, maybe no surprises. Right. But one of the big questions I think we've all been asking for the past year is these are the people that built this in a way, those people in power that benefited them, that kept the league alive, that prioritized their financial success over the health and safety of the players. Are those the same people who are going to then be entrusted to lead from a board point of view in the NWSL, the league and the players out of this moment? And that's the accountability part of it, where Sally Yates really, you know, she does not have the power to say XYZ should be fired, right? The systemic recommendations basically say NWSL, when you finish your own investigation, which is an independent investigation that is become a joint investigation with the NWSL Players Association, 
that's when you get to make decisions about the disciplinary angle. But now what we're seeing at this, you know, this past week is the pressure is so on these people who have been in power and have built the system that it's just not a sustainable thing anymore. But to me, that was a question I asked November last year is all of these people knew and we knew that they knew. We didn't maybe know the depth of what, how, like six, seven years of attempted reports, but how are these supposed to be the people who are trusted to lead anyone out of this moment? And we're speaking to you ahead of USA England and the U.S. women's national team. Uh, their leader, Megan Rapino came out and called for the ouster of a couple of NWSL owners uh, just before we started quotes, talking to you. Her quotes yeah. are, Rory's been an asshole for the entire time that I've known him. Paul Riley is the same. I don't think Merritt Paulson is fit to be the owner in Portland. I don't think Arnhem is fit to be the owner in Chicago. Right. So she's saying these things, and you're talking about sort of massive institutional change. I guess my question would be is, are we to presume that if there is a change in the ownership model and someone takes over in Portland, that these those these things won't happen again? Because one of the things we spoke to earlier, we talked to a former baseball executive earlier in the show about this issue, and we were sort of talking about how institutions protect themselves. And institutions, especially sporting ones, are generally sort of put in a position where they are going against their players, right? Usually in CBA negotiations, everything is a negotiation. I'll give you this, I'll take that. Is there an ownership model in which it is more benevolent towards players. And there is an ownership model in Angel City, which is the Los Angeles team, where I think they're they're getting some of that right, but you just never know when institutions are first and foremost protecting themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point, right? Like, change is also very costly, both from a financial point of view, but also from that sort of, you know, it's it's painful to to change the status quo. So I think there's that element, but... I don't know if there's the traditional sports ownership model is like, I don't think that necessarily leads us out of this moment, but also at this point is the NWSL going to like strip down a hundred percent of the way, right. To say, okay, there's maybe some completely revolutionary way that we can do things because I, that's a very big and tall ask. And I just don't necessarily see it happening. Right. I think the expectations are so high within the, the women's soccer landscape in terms of, I mean, I hesitate to use the term, but it does feel like a moral purity judgment sort of thing, right? Of can we trust this owner? And, and obviously like there is a reason for that right at the moment. But I mean, fundamentally sports owners, like, you know, you can say all the right things, but at the end of the day, it's about your money, right? Is this a good investment? Is it a better reason to like spend your money in a good and responsible way because you're going to be rewarded for it in this space? Maybe, right? Like if you can say, I'm a good owner <laughs> to some extent, maybe you'll get more rewarded than the others. But, you know, I think just the way that we have built sports in this country, right? NWSL certainly reflects that model. And it's not necessarily going to be some sort of like, magic bean solution for the NWSL, right? I just don't necessarily see that happening. But Angel City is interesting just because there are a lot of voices in the room. You have former players in the room, right? And there are also people there who honestly, like, don't know all that much about women's soccer and are both, like, horrified, but also don't know any better that it, it can't be done differently. And I think that's kind of been an encouraging thing. But it's not, you know, no team is going to be perfect ever. That's just not how it works, and it's there's no easy easy answer on that one. Last question. She's a senior writer for The Athletic, covers the U.S. women's national team, the National Women's Soccer League. She hosts the weekly podcast full-time with Meg Lenahan, and she has done uh, some of the critical reporting around this for the last two years. But just so the audience understands the, the humanity in this, uh, after 10 years of, of women being frustrated with what uh, the, the way that the system works against them. Can you explain the pressures that conspired one by one to make a woman feel helpless when she has been taken advantage of because everything about the system is working against her uh, getting justice or even getting her voice heard in a way that feels satisfactory? I mean, I think we've we've talked about some of them, the culture of silence, right? The complete lack of job security, the fact that coaches handle your contract, you can be traded at any moment. Let's also keep in mind that in 2013, the NWSL minimum salary was $6,000 for a season, 
right? So we're talking about that as well, the, the lack of financial security. There wasn't a union until a few years into the league, so there wasn't necessarily an institutional power that was looking out for the players. You have a lack of media coverage on a consistent basis as well that is not highlighting things that maybe people aren't building trust to to, to be able to have the outside voice. And then, again, players tried to report all of these behaviors, right? And one of the things that I think is so concerning to me is that there is this sense of like, well, 2015 was a different time. No, like all of this was unacceptable. At the, Like there's no need to say, hey, you know, like maybe by today's standards, we got this right or not. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. No. Um, no anonymous reporting mechanisms at a lot of these teams. They don't know who their HR person is. Uh, one like very minor detail that I think is actually really important is players' contracts are with the league, not the team. So you're trying to figure out, do you go to the league? Do you go to the team? There's just no clear path to figuring out who you need to tell. And then you have just this, again, a, a culture where all of the behaviors are normalized. So you're thinking, is it just me? A am I the only one seeing Am I the only one experiencing it? So you are think isolated but then there's also an enormous cost to reporting if you're trying to go public and we've seen that you i mean the decision from mana shim and shane fairly to go public with the story in september and feel like the discussions that we had about what the public reaction is going to be right to have someone read what might be the worst day of your life there's a cost to that and there's a trauma to it as well and so there's just so many different factors. That Meg, have it's a crazy. Role. It's crazy because you're not you're not articulating a single incentive to come forward. Like there, you're not. There is not one bit of support behind the idea of coming forward and making any of this public to anyone. The only reason, like I will say, the the one theme that I think we have heard so much is, I don't want this happening to someone else. Every single player who has done this, it's been less about themselves or what they've experienced. It's, I don't want a teammate going through this. I don't want another future player going through this. I don't want the next generation going through this. And so there has been this bigger than me feeling across all of these different reports of how do I protect other people and how do I make sure this doesn't happen to someone else because I am afraid for them. Meg, thank you for the reporting. It's important. Thank you. I've been wanting to sell for uh, Hurricane Relief some T-shirts that we hope to have up for you as part of Mike Ryan also eating toilet paper. Stop trying to sync those two things. Let me tell you something. The toilet paper thing was entirely my own design. I did not lose at the grid of death. All right? I didn't make a bet with any of you. Well, what'd I you just do? passively said, I'll do this. It wasn't therefore, passive. It was aggressive. Well, it was not passive. Therefore, I make the rules. I'll I don't do think it. you should make the rules on this. What? Who makes the rules? Did I make the bet with you, Dan Levitard? No. Did I make the bet with you, Sue Guy? You made no. it with the audience. No, I said, yeah. And so I will pay it off on my time. Audience doesn't get to dictate it. I will dictate it. I will eat three plies of single ply to toilet paper when I'm damn well ready and have searched this. There's all sorts of green toilet paper that is edible. I'm doing my research on this. He's TV. trying to cheat. He's I'm trying, trying to, he I'm not trying, trying to, to cheat. I made the rules. You're not you don't get to change the questions. What do you, you mean? Made a, bet. a bet is a bet and right. I don't know what I made a bet with myself. It I looked into a camera and I said, "Hey, got, they went to the bet with the yourself, audience and the, the audience, audience. wants okay. the payoff. I get what you're trying to do. You're not going to force me to do this on, at a at a quicker you, timeline. You get what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is simply get the audience its payoff because you agreed to terms on something that you are now setting different terms on. Excuse me. But excuse me. Excuse me, Dan Levitard. Out of all the people in this studio, nobody has a prouder record of actually saying what they're going to do and doing it. All right? I, I haven't seen you once show up as Prince Fielder. I haven't seen your naked ass. I, this guy. I owe nothing. This guy. This guy's. I'm still waiting for him to do poetry. Oh. All right? <laughs> I'm still waiting for that. Right. I, will eat the I will eat the toilet paper. But I will eat it when I'm damn well but ready. It brings up an interesting question that I had not considered, which is, 
When you've lost a bet, are you a man of your word if you simply pay off that bet whenever you feel like it? No, we're, months, what part months, of the bet wasn't a no, deadline? No, no. There's got to be a deadline on your bet. There has to be. Yes, there normally is when someone else makes the bet with me. I made the bet with myself. So you're saying it's open-ended. I am my governor. It's an open bet, yeah. I am I am the ruler. Mm -hmm. I establish the ground rules. Don't worry, audience. You'll get it. I'll go as far as to say you'll get it this college football season. And oh. right now, I'm a very busy man. And I don't need this on my plate right now. Which brings us to Thunderous Thursdays, because among the many busy things on your plan is Juju somehow, us always forgetting other than Juju that it is Thursday, just like we forget it's Mad Dog Wednesday, and that we have certain DraftKings commitments that have thunderous <laughs> noise behind them, that we have a Thursday parlay that we're going to put together now. And I, Mike Ryan is afraid to give his picks because I think Stugatz has been drifting and grifting and drafting off him in one of these pools they're in. I saw Stugatz last week say flatly that he was going to his computer to bet the Dolphins and then mysteriously afterward he'd bet the Bengals based on information <laughs> Mike had given on this show that he said he changed my mind after arguing on air. I go with my gut. My gut is 21-9. and nine. He got Mike Ryan's information, betrayed him, turned it into money, and turned it into life. Eyes. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> you, <laughs> here we go. It's good music, though. The music has been great on this program, by the way. Yeah. We don't miss when it comes to music. We don't have much, but we've got a thunderous sound effect, and we've got a Thursday that hasn't won anything, right? We've got the zero parlays. We've been close. We were a uh, Kareem Hunt yard. Oh, an underthrow from Joe Brandon, Burrow uh, away. A, 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 uh, yes, a, a, a Chase. Jamar Chase was a yard away. Well, keep in mind, everything that we've given out on, on Thursday Thunders, or is it Thunder Thursdays? Th I think it's Thunder Thursdays. Either way, like you can play these individually on DraftKings Sportsbook. So if it sounds good, if you played these individually, Dan, you'd be four out of six right that now. That is Love the lament life. of the loser, the lament of the parlay four loser. I, I'd rather be zero and three on a parlay than two and <laughs> one and miss by a yard. <laughs> Put it on the poll at Levitard Show, Chris Whittingham. Would you rather be zero and three on a parlay than two and one and the last one misses by an inch? Because we've had that happen to us twice. I'd now. rather miss on an inch than win it. I'm that type of sicko. But the key to a three-team parlay is hitting the first two legs and then hedging the rest. I mean, that's the key. When I win the first two legs, I'm like, oh god, I'm so I'm so close to a heartbreaker. Give me that. I don't want to win them. I don't, I'm not. You a are to Al win. Pacino. You really I are. Never feel more alive than when they're breaking the chips away. <laughs> so, <laughs> strange. so strange. It really is. I don't understand how it is that the losing makes you feel alive. <laughs> All right, Dan. So we hate tonight's Thursday night football. We which really is, do. We will still Colts, watch, though. I'll still the watch. Colts at the Broncos. I might put it on in the background. We aggressively ah! hate it. Wow, the background. <laughs> we got wait it, I thought, Wait a minute. I thought you were going to aggressively oh, avoid the, the game. Yeah. How have you gotten to the background, Whittingham? Yeah. How just, does that happen? It's just it's hard not to. It's, it's the NFL. What, 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 I mean, what else am I going to put on? So bad. <laughs> you know what? I might. You know what? I might try welcome to Wrexham tonight. Maybe maybe that'll be my Thursday night viewing instead. Oh, okay. but because we hate the game, Broncos three and a half point favorites at home against the Indianapolis Colts. I feel like because we dislike this so much, we should start with under forty two. Oof. Mm. So we Which should. Is, that's hate. a that's a low number. Yes. Mm. So we begin. Do, do you want to begin with under forty two? I'm always terrified of unders. I hate them Why? so much. Why do you hate unders? Because you're like rooting for, for things for not to happen. The first three weeks of the I season, mean, unders were like 29, 16, and 3 or the, something the like that. The reason I hate under, unders is because I don't want to watch a game where there are 17 punts rooting for everybody to stay within the 30-yard line. But then yeah. it, it fits into your narrative about the game anyway. You hate it anyway. And you, but now I have to watch it, and now mm -hmm. I have money on it, and I'd rather root for joy than root against a miserable experience that results in money. That's why, that's why they have giant towers in the desert, Dano. What's the total? Well said, by the way. 42. 42. Hmm. So a Bronco game has only gone over 42 points one out of four times this year. It was last week. Can we bet uh, Matt Ryan over 10 and a half sacks? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. There what? are defense and special teams props. Uh, Bradley Chubb over... Uh, half a sack or 0. .75. I don't know why they do. Why is it 0. .75? Oh, because you, there are half, half sacks. Half a sack, yeah. Uh, how about Bradley Chubb over over uh, three quarters of a sack? <laughs> I hate that even more. <laughs> why? Huh. What's it? Because then everybody else gets a sack right, except what him. Like, what do you like to happen in this game? So you got, you want to bet he in the He wants nothing to happen. Because I'm I mean. telling you, these prop bets, they make me crazy, okay? 
They, I, I don't like watching these games betting Osgood over 30 and a half yards. I, I will share the one bet that I've made for this game, and I'm only making this one bet. And I'm playing the under in the first half. Okay, so under, under for the game, 42. Under for the first half, 20 and a half. Bradley Chubb, over three quarters of a sack. We good? Done. 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 Deal and notarized. We are we are betting that tonight will be shit. That tonight is just everyone. That Br- Matt Ryan will break apart in pieces. We're rooting against Russell Wilson being electric. This three and a half is scary the same way that Minnesota three and a half was scary against the Saints. You just think football is going to make it three points. That half point is dangerous. Russell Wilson's... Uh, the last part of his brand is in disrepair as he makes see, uh, creepy, dangerous sub ads. He needs a big game, Stugatz. Well, no, he needs a he needs a bad game. We need a bad game. <laughs> we need a bad game. Yes. We need Russell but he Wilson. Needs a good one. We yes. are betting on our show uh, today's commentary on Russell Wilson aging well. When we all know Russell Wilson's going to throw five touchdown passes tonight <laughs> and lead a heroic comeback as uh, as the Broncos beat the Colts forty one thirty eight. All right, so this same game parlay on Colts Broncos under forty two and a half for the total, okay. under twenty and a half for the first half, right. and Bradley Chubb to get a sack is plus three. 10 on DraftKings Sportsbook. Thunder!